Father God, it goes without saying that the truths of this verse <laughs> have found their way into every day of our Christian existence. We hail the victory won, and we beg for the vision to see what is yet to come. Jesus, you are so good. May you be who we seek today. May you interrupt the distraction, the noise, the obstinance, the rebellion, and even just uh, the ignorance that we have, unaware of who you are and how you intend to yet work in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for truth that penetrates, for light that illumines the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. At risk of, um, at risk of offense and with certainty of joy, I'm going to play a little video clip if sound is on and lights could come down. I think you'll, I think you'll like this. Okay, let's try that again. Sound on, lights down. Here yes, we go. Derek. What Maury said I was willing to do for you. Let's get back to the reason that we're really here. Without much further ado, I give you the Derek Zoolander Center for Kids Who Can't Read Good. expected to teach children to learn how to read if they can't even fit inside the building. <laughs> Derek, it's just a... I don't want to hear your excuses! The center has to be at least three times bigger than this. He's absolutely right. <laughs> um, I don't know if you were ready to laugh this morning. I didn't hear enough chuckles, but my wife does want me to make sure you understand I do not support this movie. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I think that the challenge that Derek Zoolander has with this model is a challenge that we often face with biblical themes. See, what makes a prototype exciting and effective is that it gives us a three-dimensional perspective, a rudimentary type of an idealized future product. In the same way, I believe today, we're gonna catch a glimpse of a returning king. And what is missing in this prototype, king return, is what leaves us longing for the returning king, the archetype, the king of kings, Jesus Christ himself. Would you join me in 2 Samuel 19? If you are in uh, the pew Bibles, which we don't really have pews, but the black Bibles at the front or back, feel free to grab one of those. Page 253 is where we're at in that Bible. 2 Samuel uh, 19. We'll start in verse 8, the second half. Now Israel had fled every man to his own home. And all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines, and now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? And King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar the priests, saying, Say, to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house when the word of all of Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring the king back? And say to Amasa, are you not bone in my flesh? God, do so to me and more also if you are not commander of my army from now on in place of Joab. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, Return, 
both you and your servants. So the king came back to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring him over across the Jordan. As our story opens up, you'll remember that there's been a, an unfortunate and painful civil war between father and son. And in the wake of that war, there's this winning side that has not yet returned to the place of the king. Uh, king David has not yet returned to his palace or the royal entrapments of a, of a king. And so our story opens with this delayed callback of a king. And we find Israel, uh, they went to their own home because it said all of Israel had sided with Absalom. So when uh, the king uh, effectively thwarts Absalom's uh, 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 take at the throne, it leaves all of Israel in this weird position where they have uh, rejected King David, but they find their leader died in battle. They find themselves in this weird conundrum kind of asking these questions among themselves. Did, did we really shoo away the man anointed by God, the man who defeated all of our enemies and brought us to this place of prosperity and peace? Did we really raise up for ourselves a king in his place who is now dead? Can we do better than to bring David back? What would stop us? And so they make the decision, and that news, if you caught that, that news gets back to David. But when the news gets to David, because, of course, all of Israel fled, including David's own kinmen, his own people from his own tribe of Judah, also turned against him, siding with his son in this battle. And so David takes issue with this. Judah, the first, if you remember, to anoint David king in Hebron. Right? Even as Saul's son, Ishbosheth was anointed king of all the other 11 tribes, his kinsmen in Judah received his gift from his uh, various exploits and crowned him as king. But here in this moment, they balk. They drag their feet. And it would seem that David is not impressed with the progress they're making at calling him back. And so he's not willing to wait any longer, is he? So he sends, remember he had these two priests left behind, they're allies of his that stayed in Jerusalem, Abiathar and Zadok. And so he sends word to them to bring two really important messages to his people in Judah. And the ousted king takes up the campaign trail, leaving and looking for these two needed endorsements to get back a run to the throne. The first message is for the elders of Judah, uh, applying the peer pressure. You feel that in there, like, hey, hold up here. You're my people. How come Israel is talking about bringing me back, but you aren't? Leaving them to uh, the first to hail him as king or seeming to be the last to welcome him back. And the second message is for Amasa. Remember, this is David's nephew. He was commander of Absalom's armies, the defeated armies, by the way. So perhaps he is presence, his current influence, even still uh, makes this homebound uh, journey difficult. It withholds the welcome mat to David, maybe. So David addresses the scared elephant in the room by doing, by doing dirty his general, shrewd and increasingly dangerous Joab, who sees his position as David's key commander offered to Amasa instead. And that military promotion and that political pressure seemed to be sufficient for the invitation for the king's return. The story picks back up in verse 16. And Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite from Bahiram, hurried to come down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And with him were a thousand men from Benjamin. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his 15 sons and his 20 servants, rushed down to the Jordan before the king. They crossed the ford to bring the king's household and to do his pleasure. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. And he said to the king, Let not my lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my lord the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart, for your servant knows that I've sinned. Therefore, 
Behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down to meet my lord, the king. And Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? But David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be as an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had neither taken care of his feet or trimmed his beard or washed his clothes from the day that the king departed until the day that he came back in safety. And when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king... The king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go with to the king. For your servant is lame. He has slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But my lord, the king is like an angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. For all my father's house were but men doomed to death before my lord the king. But you, you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? And the king said to him, Why speak any more of your affairs? I have decided. You and Ziba shall divide the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, Oh, let him take it all, since my lord the king has come home safely. Now, Barzillai, the Gileadite, had come down from Rogalim, and he went on with the king to the Jordan and to escort him over the Jordan. Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old. He'd provided the king with food while he stayed at uh, Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. And the king said to Barzillai, come over with me, and I will provide for you with me in Jerusalem. And Barzillai said to the king, How many years have I still to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am this day 80 years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or what he drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord, the king? Your servant will go a little way over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king repay me? With such a reward. Please let your servant return that I might die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. But here is your servant, Chimham. Let him go over with my lord the king and do for him whatever seems good to you. And the king answered, Chimham shall go over with me and I will do for him whatever seems good to you. And all that you desire of me, I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan. And the king went over, and the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own home. And the king went on to Gilgal, and Chimham went with him. And all the people of Judah and half the people of Israel brought the king on his way. So we have this interesting sequence of events. See, when the king returns, some loose ends need to be tied up. I realize if you haven't been following the story up until this moment, some of what happens today is going to be lost on you. The context of these chap- this chapter is, is just wrapped up in the events that preceded this moment. Uh, so what we see in this middle section of today's story are three particular incidents of interest. Uh, and, and as you could tell, they don't happen in chronological order, do they? The first takes place before the king crosses. The second takes place in Jerusalem. And the third is back over by the River Jordan. But what it's doing is not following chronologically the return. It's following chronologically David's exposure to these characters at his exit. On his way out, he first encounters Shimei, who would dare to curse the king on his way out. Second, we see Ziba's story. The other side of it is going to get voice as Mephibosheth meets with the king. And finally, we see that rich generosity of Barzillai paid back exponentially and forward to his own beneficiary. Remember, then, with each story that unpacks here, it's going to emphasize one aspect of the king's return 
that we glimpse in part through this story that shines the light on a more deep and profound reality as we wait for our own king's eventual return. So that'll be our pattern as we look at each of these stories now. So Shimei meets with some mercy. When the welcome mat is finally rolled out, um, the text tells us that no small segment of this population rushes to the river to meet the king on his return. And some are understandably nervous about this return because if justice is served, punishment comes with the king. Therefore, the first episode is between Shimei and David, and, and it's so important that he doesn't just meet him at the Jordan. He crosses over the Jordan to meet David before he ever makes his way back west into the land of, of um, I think it's Benjamin there on the east side of, of Israel. And so we see this uh, recap might be helpful for us. Shimei was the one, as David made his exit, he was hurling both insults and stones at him from a cliff's edge as David makes his way out. And at the time, David's nephew, Abishai, was denied the privilege of removing his head. Well, David, in that moment also, if you remember, said, perhaps the Lord will one day return good to me for this evil. Perhaps he'll return blessing for this cursing. And today is that day. And so before David even gets across the ford, Shimei makes his way over to give a sopping, wet plea for mercy. And again, we see Abishai asking to take him out removing his head or removing his body from his presence. But the king has another response, and it's important for us to note, when the king returns, mercy is shown. When the king returns, we see mercy. And maybe if you're following the text, you're like me, and your bull meter is going off the scales. You're a little bit on high alert. Is David really duped by this repentance, by this display of, 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 of begging for mercy? But when the king's mercy is on display, we do well to remember it's the character of God that we see in the activities of his anointed. And therefore, mercy makes much of God. Furthermore, Shimei must, uh, we might be thinking he just wants to save his skin, but the story continues. And we know that mercy scorned retains the consequence deserved. We catch a glimpse of this in David's final moments. If you wanted to flip over with me, you're welcome to in 1 Kings chapter 2. We see David giving final instructions to Solomon who will lead in his stead. And it seems that he, he pulls out his little black book of promises to keep, enemies to avenge. And a lot of today's conversations arrive again in 1 Kings. But he says this to Solomon in, in 1 Kings 2 verse 8. He said, there was this guy Shimei, the son of Gera, who cursed me with a grievous curse the day that I went to Maenaim. But when he came down to meet me at Jordan, I swore to the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death. Now, therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man. You will know what you ought to do, and you shall bring his gray head down with blood. And breaking, after breaking his oath, to stay inside the limits of Jerusalem, Shimei meets justice. Later on in verse 43, the text gives us the end. A charge is brought by Solomon. Why did you not keep your oath to the Lord when he commanded you? And the king said to Shimei, You know your own heart all the harm that you did to David my father, so the Lord will bring harm to your own head. But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David will be established forever. And the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him, and he died. And so we see what's before us is this noteworthy, expected sequence of events. You have this shameless, massive offense heaped up by Shimei, suddenly being replaced with repentance at the pressure of the king's return and the punishment that awaits imminently. And perhaps so it is for us. Even as we come into this place, into these moments on Sunday mornings, 
and we hear the truths again of the gospel, we too are penetrated with conviction that the sin and uh, sin that is worthy of a just punishment is reminded of us that the death sentence that we deserve was carried out by our perfect and faithful substitute and that our journey even now is still plagued with moments where we meet up against challenges and exhibit behaviors of sinfulness and we struggle through that. But the Holy Spirit in this moment begins to convict, right? Just as Jesus said he would. See, when you entertain the idea that the unseen God sees you, loves you, even the conviction of the Spirit is a welcome exchange, isn't it? And this is a concern that we feel, and we ought to do so because we're quickened by the response that we too have a coming king with justice in his grip. How kind of our Lord to convict us even here and now. And don't you know that the kindness of the Lord is intended to bring us to repentance? Not the fake substitute skin saving that Shimei offered that was ultimately met with punishment, but something much different. Paul talks about it in Romans. Do you presume that the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So may we not act like Shimei in these moments when the Spirit begins. May we not try to get rid of the uh, immediate pressures but not deal with the deeper heart issues. But we have the kind of mercy encounter that leads us to repentance. Because when the king returns, mercy is shown. But our second episode involves Mephibosheth, a, a return character to, uh, from David's earlier rise to power. You remember Mephibosheth, right? He, he is the dropped son of Jonathan, David's best friend, that fall that left him handicapped, lame from the waist down, it would seem. And he's graciously brought up from hiding at an unprecedented bit of royal hospitality as David takes what ought to be his enemy, uh, the, the offspring of the former king, and instead of killing him, he gives him a place of honor seated at the king's old table, grabbing Ziba, Saul's old servant, and giving him uh, all, all of Saul's land gets given to Mephibosheth, and Ziba is supposed to take care of that land so that Mephibosheth can enjoy the royal palace continuously. You may remember that in this moment of David's retreat, Ziba leaves Mephibosheth hanging. In doing so, all the land that was Saul's that came to David in his ascent was given to Ziba in that moment. And so here today, we, we get Mephibosheth's plea for justice. Whether he was summoned or the meeting was requested by him, this, king, this meeting with the king it takes place in Jerusalem. Could you imagine this position? What an unenviable position to be in. Uh, to go inform the king that he had blessed the efforts of a bold-faced liar whose earlier deceit left Mephibosheth out to dry. You know, special effects of body cosmetics and, and Hollywood's artificial AV aging techniques, they weren't available and they weren't needed. The crusty smell of the full body mourning that Mephibosheth had been in since David's departure filled that room. He'd worn his sorrow from the moment of the king's departure, not cutting his nails, not cleaning his body, not washing his clothes. And if this is, it just feels gross to you, this is this visible, visceral image. I'm not well because things with my king aren't well. And it was obvious to David in that moment taking him to a place of reconsideration. As we hear the story shared by Mephibosheth, it would seem that Ziba had been sent to ready a steed for his lame master, but instead of getting the lame master, he jumped on the steed and left and fabricated and spread the untrue story of Mephibosheth's loyalties continuing to be against David. So Saul's land was divided. 
and given back to Ziba. But this is interesting. As Ziba, uh, sorry, as Mephibosheth comes before the king, he has this plea for justice. He's been wronged, and he wants justice. And when the king returns, not only is mercy sh- uh, shown, but justice is known. And he gives him back, splitting the land equally between the two. And just as the king's extension of mercy to Shimei leaves us feeling a little bit unsatisfied, because we know that this is not all right, man. Something's wrong here, right? In the same way, as we watch justice, well, what would justice be? If it was a lie, justice, the land would go back to Mephibosheth. It wouldn't be split. That's not just at all. But it's a sure better position than he was when he came into that room. But it leaves us longing, doesn't it? It leaves us wondering, uh, when will justice come? When will clarity uh, rightly divide that which we can't see? Because this justice is as misshapen as the contradictory testimony that the judge is forced to cope with. But we don't need to worry about this for one day. When the king of all kings returns, true justice will be known. All that is kept hidden from our eyes that are impaired by imperfect sight is going to be open, laid bare before the king of all kings who is the just judge, and we don't have to worry. We saw this last week, but I'll say it again. When the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and a flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel, of Jesus Christ. The flames of final judgment will expose the reality of every evil action. And all evil will be eradicated. And all who have been wronged will be restored. Amen. Have you ever considered how wonderful it is that this side of glory, we encounter this conviction, this dividing, this piercing of truth and lie, even here and now. We're told in Hebrews that the word of God does this because the word of God is living and active like a double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of hearts so that no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, the truth of God's word is presently surveying your heart under the word of God, parsing out the pieces that have salvageable, redemptive capacities and showing what needs to be dealt with at the foot of the cross, what needs to be left behind, what needs to be given a gracious transplant. What a mercy that we glimpse this even here and now. Our final episode involves Barzillai, and he bequeaths his blessing to another. He, he's a figure from more recent history, right? He padded David's retreat, his landing, with an unsuspected but much needed supplies. When David arrives at Maenaim, he offers them beds for rest, basins for bathing, wheat for bread, barley and beans, and bowls from which to eat them. Having received him with this abundant offering, He walks with David. It's like a tender moment. You know, like uh, some of my favorite conversations when we gather together are with the believers who've walked with Jesus for 50, 60 years. And there's just this sweet readiness to meet the Lord. And there's no contention over some doctrinal issue. There's no like, oh, but you did this wrong. There's just a sweetness about them. And you get that glimpse with Barzillai, don't you? That he just, he is loyal to his king. Whatever it costs, whatever offering it takes, he's loyal to his king and he walks him to the water's edge. And in this moment, a biblical principle emerges, right? That those who seek to be a blessing to God and his anointed are actually those who are blessed in return. Perhaps David is even drawing from his own encounter with God. Remember this? He, he saw his house of cedar and he's like, oh, if only I could give God something like this, I will build him the best temple ever. I will bless God. And God says, yeah, no, I'm going to bless you. You'll have an offspring on the throne, a promise that la- lasted up until Jesus, who is the king, who will never vanquish his throne, never let go of his throne. 
And so in this moment, we see this beautiful uh, truth that Paul tells us when he talks to the Ephesian elders. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. A blessing of unprecedented proportions has been offered. And it seems as if, at first, Brazilii is inclined to decline the offer, doesn't it? He's like, oh, I'm too old to appreciate the luxury. My dulled senses would diminish these elegant tastes. I'm too deaf to appreciate the glorious sounds of the royal choir. Undoubtedly, he would be a burden to the king. In this present display of kindness, sending the king with this blessing doesn't need anything else in return. And then in that last moment, he says, oh, but, but consider Chimham. Chimham, his offspring. If you look at 1 Kings, it says there are the two sons of Barzillai were given blessing. And so we see then that this royal blessing wasn't just returned to Barzillai, but a substitute beneficiary was brought forward to receive that blessing. And when the king returns... Mercy is shown, justice is known, and blessing is bestowed. The blessing of God on the people of God was always intended to flow through them to the nations, right? Remember this promise from Abraham. From your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed, right? And we're, and we're told that as Paul elaborates on this promise, that the blessing would be a singular offspring providing this. In Galatians 3, he says, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It doesn't say offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Sin's separating curse needed to be absorbed by a sacrificial son so that the blessed adoption could be for all who would believe. And we see that here. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Indeed, when the king returns, blessing is known. And we get this now, don't we? It's, it's an already present but imperfect reality, as Jesus tells us. Truly, I tell you, no one who's left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel will not receive a hundredfold. Now, in this time, houses, brothers, sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. It's remarkable to me that we walk as those who've already encountered the blessed presence of God, the return. What's mine is yours means that all of us go without lack in the family of God. It's a blessing received now even as we endure hardship, persecution, calamity, frustration, and failed efforts to do right. But the irrevocable blessing of Christ's presence is sufficient, is it not? That is the three-part center of our story, but he wraps up with this squabble. Let's finish up, let's land the plane as we see how this story wraps up. As we go back to 2 Samuel 19 and verse 41, he says, all the men of Israel came to the king and said to him, why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household over to the Jordan and all of David's men with him? And the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense? Or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, We have ten shares in that king, and in David also we have more than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of of Israel. See, our text today, it opens with all of Israel delaying their callback, and it ends with all of Israel dividing 
over the credit. Just like the beauty of the Grand Canyon is slightly compromised by squabbling siblings in the black seat, the sweet moments of our king's return are soured by an emerging rivalry between the north and the south. You can imagine this, right? Hands on the wheel. Here's your snack, kids. His is bigger, is not, is too. He hit me, did not, did too. Isn't this sunset nice? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, really? Like after, this is about the king's return. And we're, and we're watching before our very eyes the splinter of a future kingdom split. Oh, reminds me of me. <laughs> reminds me of how I encounter the Lord. Another visceral reminder of the fragile conditions in which we experience the already kingdom reality with not yet glories that come with our king. Our text today is like a peanut butter M&M. This hard shell on the outside, though there's this gooey sweet center in the middle. Except with the M&Ms, they're both good. So, but you know what I'm saying here. We, 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 we come back to this division at the end. and I don't know what you're facing in life. But whatever it is you're facing, there's relevance to today's text, and I'll tell you why. Are you dragging your feet on the obvious conclusion to welcome Jesus to be king of your life? Delay no longer. Do you think you've outwitted God because as you survey your immoral life, it seems as if judgment day will never come? Don't scorn the mercy of God. See, the mercy of God rightly received repents, and repentance that is not genuine keeps the original consequence of punishment. So wait no longer. Have the dark deeds and shameless deceit of others left you on the wrong side of justice? Begging for the day when restoration can happen? God is not going to be mocked. And judgment day is coming. Your justice, friend, comes with the king. So hold on. As in the intended conduit of God's rich blessing, you have been created to be a conduit of God's blessing. Have you turned off the valve, denying your friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers the glorious realities of your already restored love with God? Keep in mind, I have on good word, it's more blessed to give than receive. Like our story's conclusion, are you pricked by the splinters of our broken race, daily concerned and brought down by the negativity and the attacks of others that you wished you could trust? Let me send you out with the final words of Jesus and the final pages of Scripture. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words and the prophecy of this book. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning in the end. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus, we view the panoramic of a text like this, and it feels like you don't ever want us to be satisfied, and I think that's part of the point. <laughs> As we look to a time when all that's unsatisfying and left hanging and loose ends that are still loose even after they've been tied, remind us that one day you will come. The full beauty of your mercy will be known and we will worship like we've never worshiped. Because we will fully understand what we see dimly now, we will see clearly in your presence that you've paid an ultimate price and you are worthy of everything, and we will never stop singing, worthy, worthy, worthy are you. Not all injustice is made the same. And so some of us here today, maybe even what keeps us from you in this moment 
is somebody else's wrong against us. And we know that it's ultimately a wrong against you. And so would you give us in this moment the clarity to see the good, faithful Father who saves and promises restoration. Awaken in us faith for that day, Jesus. A day that doesn't long for vengeance because vengeance is yours, but is so saturated with the love of Christ because like we've been forgiven, we forgive. Like we've encountered grace upon grace, we live into that grace with others. We're desperate for you to work in our midst, so continue the things we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.